So now we move on to the question of whether the activity that you want to undertake with a particular work is subject to an exclusive right of copyright. So if you conclude, or you prefer to simply assume, that the materials you want to use in a data mining project are subject to copyright protection as protected works, then the next question you will have is whether your use of that work is subject to an exclusive right of the copyright holder. As in the definition of works, there's a fair amount of uniformity between laws on this question. So the broadest right in copyright is the right of reproduction, the right to literally make a copy. The Berne Convention requires that copyright laws protect against reproduction in any manner or form. Laws normally require that a substantial amount of a work be copied in order to constitute a reproduction. And there are exceptions that we'll discuss in the next section for the use of mere excerpts. But there are courts that we know of that have held that as few as 11 words from a work can still constitute a substantial reproduction for purpose of the reproduction right. So countries have generally implemented the reproduction right broadly. German law, for example, excludes all copies by whatever method, in whatever quantity. So here, think about whether any or all of the activities that you might want to undertake for a TDM project involve a reproduction of the work in any method and in any quantity. Note that the whatever method language in Germany's law or the manner or form language in Bern may apply to reproductions made by computers. Clearly, you need to reproduce works to make a corpus of them, but what about running a query using a TDM tool? Does the computer need to make a copy of the work, even into its memory for a temporary period, to run that query? And what about the whatever quantity factor? Would even a quotation for illustration fall into that definition? Again, we'll talk about exceptions to those definitions later, and the purpose of this exercise is to show you how important those exceptions are. Because if you start with just the description of the rights, they do appear to apply extremely broadly. So you can pause this video now if you want and fill in some of your answers into the worksheet before going to the next slide, where we'll talk about a few more rights that international law requires. So there are more rights than just the reproduction right, although the reproduction right can probably do most or all of the work that these other rights do as well. So the reproduction right, which is the most central and oldest right in copyright, is certainly incredibly broad. But international laws have expanded on the definition over time, adding new exclusive rights for activities that may not involve a technical reproduction at all. So first, Byrne requires protection against the translation or adaptation of works in addition to reproduction. So some prominent commentators have opined that translation and adaptation rights may apply not only between human languages or between different forms of the same expression, for instance, adapting it from a play into a movie or a movie into a poem, etc., but also translations from one computer language to another. Later treaties require that countries protect the right to distribute, communicate, or make available the work. So the WIPO Copyright Treaty of 1996 includes a requirement that countries joining that treaty protect distribution through sale or transfer. And notice the or. So it applies to transfers even that are not a sale. It's generally accepted that a distribution can take place when one transfers the work to another person whether that be a hard copy or sharing a file. Now, some transfers are exempted from the distribution right. Copyright's exclusive right to control the distribution of a work within the same country is exhausted, that is, the right ceases to bind, after the first sale of that work in that country. So this is why used bookstores can occur and why you can gift one book to another person. Once you've bought that book, from an authorized seller, the right to prohibit further distributions of that work is exhausted. 
But in some countries, exhaustion doesn't apply outside of the country where the first sale occurs. So even though you could sell or give away a book to a person within the same country in which you bought it, you can't necessarily do that same transaction across borders. Now, the U.S. is one of the countries that recognizes international exhaustion. This was a Supreme Court case on this a few years ago, the Kirstein case. So that case actually held that a United States recipient did have a right to receive a book and actually, in that case, purchase a book from a seller in another country where that work was distributed, where it was first sold. So in that case, it was, it was a student who found a cheaper copy of a textbook in Thailand and bought the book from Thailand and had it shipped to them in the United States. And that was found to be lawful. But in some countries, that same transaction might not be lawful. So again, it depends where the activity is located that you're doing. Are you, are you transferring a book from Thailand to France or from Thailand to the United States? There may be different answers to that question depending on where um, the activity is taking place. And note also that very few countries apply the exhaustion right to digital transfers. Also note that making available rights can be infringed by allowing members of the public to access works from a place and at a time individually chosen by them. So this was a standard put into international treaties to combat um, the piracy through streaming. So the objective was to make sure that someone individually downloading or individually watching or streaming a work at a time individually chosen by them, so the communication was just between that site and that individual person, that that would still be defined as a public, making available to the public. So if your database was doing the same thing and making your corpus available to individual members of the public, even if it was at a time individually chosen by them, it could still fall under the making available exception. Of course, we'll talk more in limitations and exceptions about are you really making your corpus available to the public when you just make it available to maybe a small number of other researchers to use. So again, these broad terms need exceptions to cabin them to their appropriate purposes. Applied literally, copyright would overprotect, it would overexclude a huge number of activities. So if you go back to your worksheet, you should now be able to fill out some of the particular rights that might be implicated by the different activities. And if we end here, the copyright environment looks pretty daunting. There may be limiting interpretations of these concepts in domestic courts or court decisions, and really knowing all of those is beyond the scope of this lecture. But at least on their surface, you may be able to conclude that all the uses of works discussed in our worksheet, and maybe you have more, could be subject to copyright law exclusive rights on their face. And thus, for a great many of text and data mining project activities, you're going to need help from the next section on limitations and exceptions. So before moving on to that next session, please make sure you have filled out the second column in your worksheet, the one identifying the different exclusive rights that may be needed in order to undertake TDM activities.